Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of E-Commerce Mastery. I'm your host, Ben Gothard, and today we have the honor of speaking with a gentleman who started off his journey with no running water, literally sleeping on a bed he picked up from the streets and having to distribute flyers on the streets for one euro per hour. From there to now being an extraordinarily successful entrepreneur, multiple businesses, helping tens of thousands of clients. He has courses, he has sites, he's all over social media, dominating the online marketplace. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Damien Proselendis. How you doing today, man? Thank you, Ben, for the awesome introduction. I'm very glad to be on your show, man. It's a pleasure to, to be here with you today. Dude, the pleasure is all mine. Seriously, thank you for carving out the time. So I would love to get started. We're going to talk about first your story, then we're going to dive into four principles of business that you've used to go from where you started to where you are. But before, before we dive into the principles, let's learn about that journey of where you started and where you are now. I'd love to hear that mm -hmm. story. All right. So I started as a broke university student in Greece, studying chemical engineering. Uh, I've got a sponsorship for that. So I didn't get any college loan. Uh, it was uh, granted to me by the government because I had achieved high grades at the Panhellenic exams. And that basically gave me access to the faculty of chemical, uh, chemical engineering. Uh, but while doing that, uh, it was a very hard time for me financially. Uh, I was being supported by my parents. And when I'm saying I was being supported, I mean, they were just giving me a small stipend of about 200 euros a month that I had to get by with every single month. And when you consider that a student's expenses are like uh, rent, utilities, even with a very, very cheap rent in a one-bedroom apartment that costs... Uh, like 300 euros a month uh, in Greece in not so great neighborhoods plus utilities uh, 200 is not even enough to cover for that so I had to do all jobs to get by I worked as a waiter in the summers in Greek taverns uh, waiting tables washing dishes sometimes um, I contemplated working as a lifeguard bartender and other old jobs like that and so for some time, I did flyer distribution in the streets for like one euro per hour. That was my lowest paid job. It didn't last that much, like only 10 to 15 days, because it also included um, like putting posters up on the walls. And I had to do that late at night after university, after I had studied and after I had gone to the gym and done my dance classes because back then I wanted to be a dancer. So after all that, I would go out uh, in the dark around 12 a.m. Uh, in pretty shady neighborhoods and put the posters on the walls. And I'm contemplating about that. I'm lucky I didn't get robbed or worse. Maybe somebody could have uh, pulled a knife on me or threatened me. And yeah, it wasn't a safe place to be walking around, especially that late at night. It was full of druggies and other people of questionable character. Yeah. So after uh, all that situation, uh, because I wasn't able to pay that small rent, I had to move out of my apartment. I lived with my girlfriend for about a year and she paid for all of our expenses. And uh, I got sick of that as well because it was pretty embarrassing having a female uh, in control of your finances and you not being able to do anything, it feels kind of powerless. So I moved out of your apartment and managed to get a small dorm room uh, from my university that was given to the poorest students as financial aid. And that was basically, it's called uh, an SRO, single room occupancy. It's a very small, like a jail cell kind of room of that size. And it's Basically like a jail cell with the only difference that it doesn't have the, you know, the bars. You're free to get in and out of it. Uh, it also included public bathrooms because it didn't have running water. 
I had to shower in public facilities, uh, the same, I used the public toilet and ate for free. Uh, I was on food stamps in the university's dining hall. So that was kind of my reality back then, uh, including cockroaches roaming around in my room and sleeping on a mattress I picked up from the trash. So all that um, was uh, an embarrassing, humiliating experience. And I felt disadvantaged compared to all my classmates at university and my old friends who were now living the student life. They were partying. They could go out every night. And whether that's meaningful or not, that's another part of for a different conversation. But I didn't have the ability to do any of the things they did. And that just felt uh, very, very embarrassing and humiliating. I felt like somebody wronged me like life was unfair to me and I blamed my parents, I blamed the government, the financial situation in my country, anything but myself in the beginning. And after a while, I realized that I would get nowhere by pointing the finger uh, to others and not taking responsibility for my life. And I was also fed up by, by all that financial situation and struggle and I realized that uh, there was no chance in hell I would then do that for four more years in order to get my degree for the uncertain promise of a better future. So I don't know if you want to ask me any questions on that uh, because I've been speaking for a while or I, should, I could continue with how I developed into building the business. Yeah, how did you go from there to then building everything that you've built? All right, so in the beginning, I had no idea what I was doing and I had no concept that an online business could work or any business for that matter because I didn't come from an entrepreneurial family. I didn't have, um, my parents weren't businessmen. My grandparents were farmers. My uncle was a self-employed dentist and that was the world I was living in. Those people shaped my perception of what was possible for me. So. My, my idea back then was that my best shot a good life was to become a self-employed professional like my dentist uncle. And that's the reason I went to university. My mother was a civil servant and my father was unemployed. So a university degree and the option of being self-employed sometime in the future was my only idea of some kind of potential success for me. So in that environment, I had found online business from when I was 15 years old was the first time I stumbled upon information regarding online business, but I didn't take it seriously. I couldn't believe it would work because I had never seen it work for anybody in my close circle. So sometimes um, your the people that you have around you and the lives they're living, they are also constraining you uh, and they keep you in an area of development close to where they are. But all that changed when I, motivated by all that financial misfortune, I started browsing the internet and somehow, I don't even remember how exactly, I stumbled upon a website that said, it was written by a guy, an American guy who had moved to Thailand and had become a digital nomad. And he said that he was making $10,000 a month from his website, writing articles and uh, selling eBooks and doing affiliate marketing. And all that was totally foreign to me uh, back then. And I couldn't even grasp the idea of just sitting on your laptop at some beach in Thailand and making $10,000 a month, which was more than my uncle was making after 20 years of being in business and after five years of getting his degree and his postgraduate studies, it was just incomprehensible for me. And I knew that there was no way I could make that money with my degree in chemical engineering. Even maybe if some day I was 50 years old and I had studied a lot and rose up the corporate ladder and Maybe by some kind of chance, I could make that kind of money. But there was a young guy, he was only 30, and he was making that whilst being 
financially free and traveling the world. And that was just mind blowing for me. And I knew there was a chance he could be a scammer. He could be somebody who could try to take money from me. But it was just, I had no other option. You know, the hope that that thing would work was the only thing that just kept me motivated and woke me up in the morning. That is incredible that that one, the one chance encounter with this individual totally opened, at least gave you some sort of exposure to this whole new world and totally shifted your perspective, at right. least into thinking about this. Yeah, because sometimes it's, it's only your mind that keeps you, that holds you back because um, you know, have you heard the story about the four minute mile? I have, yeah. So basically it was an unbreakable record. I don't remember the exact time that you'd have to, um, when it happened. I think it was like 20 years ago or something. Anyway, so the four minute mile could not be broken. The record could not be broken. And everybody believed that it was physically impossible for the human body to break the record. Even scientists had conducted experiments and everybody considered it just incomprehensible. And there came that one guy who broke the record. And then after him, just everybody was breaking the record like it was nothing. So sometimes all it takes is that shift in your mind that it can't be done. And if you see somebody else doing it, then you start realizing that hmm, maybe it's possible for me as well. That is powerful. So you get exposed to this. It's, yeah. it's starting to, to shift your mindset. How do you then start taking action and get to start, start making things work? All right. So first of all, uh, you got to have a reason, something within you that makes you want to take action. Because if you rest comfortably, sometimes people um, live comfortable in their misery. And they don't have that something that drives them to take action. Even if they might be exposed to the right people and the right information, they just don't do it. And I have a lot of people I know right now, many friends of mine, many people that I've tried to motivate and give them the tools and tell them how they can start their own business and how they can change their lives. And they just don't do it. And for a while, I couldn't understand that, but we are just uh, at a point where they don't feel any kind of discomfort. There is no pain. There is no suffering in their lives. They're not, their lives are not great but they don't suck either. So they just stay where they are, that equilibrium of emotional like uh, certainty. They don't, uh, they try to avoid the, ex the extremes. So for me, it wasn't like that. Um, my life sucked, literally, it, it, it was horrible. Uh, there was no enjoyment in my daily reality apart from the dance classes I was taking. It was the only thing like that made me feel alive. And even university, I hated that. Uh, I mean, it was something I was kind of forced to do. Well, I mean, they didn't put a gun on my head, but my parents basically guided me to that direction. It wasn't what I wanted to do. So being in that place of financial struggle was gave me that inner fire to make me want to do something with the information I encountered. And then secondly, me dancing and getting so much joy out of that but not being able to follow that career path fully because I, I lack the financial resources to do so that also added more more like uh, gasoline to the fire and ignited it even further because there I had something that I really liked to do but I couldn't even pay for my dance classes I couldn't travel and dance I couldn't go to seminars so I had that thing that really made me feel alive and I couldn't leave it. So all those things combined gave me a reason why I should take action. And that's why I was able to act upon that information. And from there, it was just easy. 
because if you have that something that wakes you up in the morning and you don't feel like uh, turning off the alarm clock, then I mean, how can you possibly fail if you wake up every day fired up and you do everything that can be done during that day, just a matter of days until you succeed, it's just impossible to fail. So you get fired up, you know the course of, of generally where you're headed. What exactly did you do? Like what action did you take to build your first business? How, how did you really go about building it and then um, leveraging that to build other businesses? Mm-hmm. So in the beginning, the only online business I knew of was blogging and affiliate marketing. So I started off with that. I had no idea there were so many other business models and different career paths you could take by leveraging the power of the internet. So I started off with that. Uh, I started my own blog, DarrenConquer.com, and I started writing about uh, pretty much the only thing I had knowledge on, which was fitness. Uh, working out in the gym and bodybuilding. So I wrote about that and I also tried to write about success and self-improvement, but I was so early in my stage of development that my writing on those topics just wouldn't attract any attention. And I wrote and I wrote and I wrote for five months straight and I couldn't get anybody to read my blog. Maybe it was three or five people that were reading it. I had a little email list of uh, hundred people at the time after five months of writing two blog posts a day and I had also created a couple of ebooks which were not selling anything so I was kind of disappointed that after all that time I had not made a single dollar so I realized that that was going nowhere and I started researching new ways to start making money online because at that time I had decided to drop out of university and I knew that unless I made that online thing work, um, I would either have to resume my studies whilst knowing that I had lost one year from my curriculum and I would have to repeat the same year, which would mean I would graduate later and my whole suffering would be prolonged. So I started researching information and I stumbled upon new ideas on how to make money freelancing. And uh, there was that site called Fiverr.com and there was a guy who said he was making some money by freelancing on Fiverr, selling services on there. So I enrolled on the platform and started selling the only service I was skilled at, kind of skilled at, which was article writing in English, which is not even my native language. So you can imagine how that uh, unfolded. I didn't make any money doing that either. So after six months uh, and without having made a single dollar, I was about to give up. I got a new job as a bartender. And luckily I got fired on the same day I got the job. So I was pretty disappointed at that point and I was ready to just give it all up. It was early in the summer and I would go back to my hometown and then start my, my class again the next semester. But that was the, the turning point. You know, it's like there, there are those memes, not memes, like educational, meaningful images where there are two people under the under the soil and they are digging they're digging for gold and you see one person it's just an inch of uh, of soil before they discover the gold and they keep digging and there's just another person at the same distance and they just give up at that point because they had seen they, they haven't seen any reward so if you just go a little bit further after that point where you see that nothing works that's where you usually you find that something works so I hopped back on Fiverr, re- revised my whole profile because it wasn't very professional. And that's the reason why I couldn't make any sales. I had just pulled a random uh, image of some guy with a suit from Google and pretended that that was me. <laughs> and I was selling a service uh, in broken English that I wasn't good at. I uh, didn't have any like competitive advantage. There were thousand other people selling article writing and I had no way to differentiate myself my presentation sucked Um, people could not see any samples of my word 
they could not see how my pro my end product would look like. So why the hell would they buy from me? So I we did all that and took a challenge to write a thousand words a day to improve my writing skills. And I uploaded the best of those articles on my profile in order to give my clientele some samples to look at. I also improved my presentation, removed the image from um, the fake guy from Google. And I started studying copywriting in order to write a more persuasive sales page on Fiverr for my service. <clears throat> and as I did that, I started getting a couple of orders. It wasn't much in the beginning. It was $5 there, $10 there, but okay, it was better than nothing. And eventually my first, my first official month of Fiverr, I made about a thousand dollars. And that for me back then was life changing. I did that by solely by selling article writing services. But it wasn't that much, but it only helped me realize that it was possible to make money online. And I just kept improving my services from that point. Then I got into copywriting. I started selling copywriting services. And by adding that, it gave me a different flair, a different advantage in the marketplace. I had a skill that was a little bit more rare and hard to find that simply writing articles. And that basically boosted my revenue. Well, it was basically a whole profit. So it wasn't even revenue. It was whole profit. Anyway, to about two, two to three thousand dollars the second and third month. And there I noticed a pattern where many of my clients were Amazon sellers who wanted copywriting specifically for Amazon. So I thought that if this thing is happening again and again and again, maybe there is demand for it. So I searched on Fiverr for copywriting for Amazon listings and there was nobody selling that service. So there that light bulb went off and I'm like, hmm, maybe I'm onto something here. I set up a new service for that as well. And from there on, it was just it skyrocketed. It was huge success, $5,000 my four months on the platform. And from there on, it was just all the way to 100K a month. That is awesome. So it took like almost a year to get to the point where you made your first money in. And then it seems like you redid it, you refined it, you got better, you focused in on honing your craft of copywriting. And then you niche down from article writing into copywriting. And then you niche down even more into copywriting for Amazon listings. And that's really when things took off and, uh, and, and blossomed for you. Exactly. And I stopped niching down from there because uh, if my service got any more specialized, I figured that it would have no demand and it would just be pointless to do that. I had found that just that sweet spot of, enough specialization to have a skill that's rare and in demand but not too much specialization that's just uh, there is not enough demand for it out there because if you said if i sold for example copywriting for um i don't know for ant sellers if somebody there's somebody out there selling ants and i sold copywriting exclusively for that it's an absurd example but it's just too specialized and there's just no demand for it there is no way it will succeed so when you start a business, any business, you have to figure out how you enter a segment of the market where there is, um, it's like a blue ocean and a red ocean. There is that concept from, from the book of the same name, if you've read it, I don't know. It's called Blue Ocean Market, I think. Uh, and basically it describes how there are saturated markets where everybody's selling the same thing. And that's what I was doing with article writing. And there there are unsaturated markets where there is nobody or very few people selling that service. And when you get on those, you can dominate them because you're just one of the few or maybe the first to enter that space in the marketplace. That's brilliant. And I think this is a perfect time to move into our fundamentals here because the very first fundamental that we're going to talk about is time of entry. So time of entry in a marketplace is crucial. Timing in business is one of the most important things 
because you might have the right business idea, but if you execute it at the wrong time, it's not going to work. So electric cars are a thing now, but they couldn't have been a thing back in 1995 for various reasons. Similarly, uh, things like e-commerce were not as developed in the past as they are right now because in the past there wasn't the right infrastructure. So you could have the, um, the, the idea that you, e-commerce would be big at some point, but if you executed it 20 years ago, you wouldn't be doing it at the right time. So when you enter the market, it's, it's very crucial. And what's also important is how many other people are in that market space that you're trying to enter. Because usually if you are amongst the first, you grab a share of the marketplace and customers get acquainted with you. And if they get acquainted with you and they have a good experience, even if another competitor comes in, they don't want to change because humans in general abhor change. We don't want to do things outside our, our comfort zone. And if we are happy with a product or a service, it's very unlikely that we are going to change that and move over to something else unless that something else is just such a huge edge that makes us want to try it. And even if we try it, we, we might still do it reluctantly and not change from our usual choice just because it's something that we've been doing for so much time and it just, it's a part of ourselves. We are committed to it and we don't want to change it. So by being the first to enter a segment of the market, you develop that sense of familiarity with your target customers. And if you serve them well, it's very unlikely that they're going to change and they're going to prefer a competitor over you. And that's very, it's, that's largely why my business was so successful because I was the first to sell uh, copywriting for Amazon services, for Amazon uh, listings on Fiverr. And I basically grabbed the largest pool of the customer base and everybody that tried to sell that service after me got some power results. That makes so much sense. And we can look back in history to see that that's so, so, so true. Take PayPal, for example. They were the first ones to, they basically pioneered um, email-based payments online. And look how big they got. And they got the ability to capture all of that market share before anybody else could really compete with them. Same with Amazon and AWS. I was watching an interview with Jeff Bezos and he said, and he said, this is unprecedented and he has no idea why this happened, but he said AWS had about a seven year head start before there was any serious competition in cloud computing. Mm -hmm. So think about that. If you have seven years of a head start before anybody else comes to compete with you, you can dominate your market. So the time of entry, absolutely brilliant. So, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. you, you really have to f*** it up big time to <laughs> lose business if you are the first to grab the biggest piece of the pie and then just lose it to somebody else. It, just, it could happen because of negligence. It could happen because you stopped iterating and improving. It could happen for, very, for many reasons, but uh, it's certainly a big mistake you made along the way if, you, if that happened to you. Absolutely. So let's now move on to our second fundamental here and talk about customer service being a super critical and amazingly powerful lever that we can pull to grow our business. Yep. Customer service is basically <clears throat> the driving engine of any business because if you serve your clients well and their experience from the moment they discover you to the moment that they get their service or their product delivered and to the moment that they come back and shop from you again if you serve them well and they are satisfied at every critical point along that uh along that way 
they're just gonna keep coming back to you, keep coming back to you, bring you more recurring revenue. And they're also gonna refer people to you just because they're satisfied with your service. And then your business grows basically simply out of uh, word of mouth marketing. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't rely or shouldn't exploit advertising uh, because it's also a very powerful uh, avenue of uh, generating a bigger client base. But the, the fundamental growth that occurs with proper customer service and word of mouth marketing that's just unmatched and it doesn't cost you anything to just take care of the simple things in the experience that customers have shopping with you, like replying to their email, to their uh, requests promptly and quickly, which is a very simple thing, but not many businesses do it. Many businesses have horrible customer service. They take a long, long time to reply to customers and they usually tend to not resolve their problems either, or they point the blame to the customer um, justified with some scripted policy that they have, it's just an ignorant and uncaring customer service agent who just doesn't care about the customer and operates um, out of a manual without any kind of critical sense, without without caring at all about the customer, and that just leaves the customer unsatisfied, and that opens you um, that opens you to having that customer stolen from you by a compared to just service and bet. That makes so much sense. And I love how you, you, we started off that fundamental by talking about how investing your, your time and energy into providing extraordinary customer service can then lead to new customers. Because when you take extraordinary care of your customer and they go and tell their friends who are probably also potential customers of yours yes like attracts like <clears throat> taking care of that one customer that you already have can then multiply that customer and then when you take care of, so let's say one multiplies to three then when you take care of those next two those two will then multiply to six and so on and so forth and so you can almost achieve viral growth just by taking care of your customers at such an incredible level uh, going back to paypal that's one of the things that they did so well was they took care of their customers to the point where their customers referred other, other, other customers. So they grew to hundreds of thousands of people within a couple of months and it was extraordinary growth. It's, uh, it, it's almost a no brainer that very few businesses do. Yep. Compounds, uh, positive okay. feedback from customers compounds, just like, negative feedback and negative feedback actually compounds even more because when you discover that you have a complaint from a customer, an unsatisfied customer, it usually means that there are probably three times, maybe even 10 times that amount, uh, more customers who have just not expressed the same complaint that that one customer did. So every time that you discover that there is something off that like, every time that a customer tells you that there is something wrong or something has upset them, it's usually not the only person. It's just the only person that's expressing the complaint. So by resolving the issue for that one customer, by doing that, you know that you've resolved it for many other people who might have used your product or your service, and they weren't satisfied, but they just didn't express their concerns with you. And they just uh, were ready to hop on the competitor's train. So customer service and the whole customer experience is like having, having a chain with multiple different parts. And you want to keep every part of the chain intact. Because if there is uh, a broken link in that chain, then the whole customer experience goes south. For example, let's say you have a clothing brand and a digital business selling clothes and you make it really hard for the customer to process refunds or returns for your clothes. 
you ship you ship their product to them. Uh, maybe you use drop shipping. Maybe you use print on demand. Maybe you have a warehouse and you ship ship the product. But regardless of the distribution method, you have a very very hard for the customer way to return the product to you if they are unhappy. So there comes another brand like uh, Asus, which gives basically worldwide free returns at their expense and make it ridiculously easy for the customer to return clothes that don't fit them all or that they just don't like anymore. They, maybe you ordered something and then it comes and it's not the way you imagined it to be and you want to send it back. And if you know you're ordering from a place that just gives you unlimited free returns, you're just going to keep going back to that because it's just easier for you. So the easier you make it for the customer to use your product or your service, the better the customer experience is and the more likely it is that they are going to uh, be recurring, recurring payers. That's a great point too because – we all know, or we all should know by this point, that it is way easier to continue doing business with one customer over and over and over again than it is to go out and win an entirely new customer to your business. So this is like a hack to basically keep your customers with you. Just treat them right and they'll stay with you because it's so rare in today's world. Most people don't treat the customers right. So stand out by doing so, you set yourself worlds apart. So we talked about time of entry, customer service. Let's move into our third fundamental here of crafting your unique selling uh, proposition and making sure to position your brand appropriately. Mm -hmm. So no matter what kind of business you're in, how, why should your customer choose you over a competitor? What it is that you do differently or better than your competitors that makes your customers want to be your customers and not somebody else's. And this is something that you have to really think about and not just once because you have to constantly be iterating your unique selling proposition as your business evolves. For example, with my e-commerce consulting firm in the beginning, our unique selling proposition was nothing. We didn't have any leverage over our competitors other than being the first to sell that service. But because of that, we transitioned to having the most reviews on the platform and the bigger clientele. And that became our uh, unique selling proposition that we are the most reviewed and highest ranking service for Amazon listings on Fiverr, and that's why you should choose us. And that uh, also includes social proof in the unique selling proposition, which is a uh, psychological bias that uh, amplifies sales volume, and that makes the customer want to choose you. So from that point there, because we've been getting a lot of orders from clients and we've been working with them very hands-on, uh, managing their Amazon dashboards and seeing things from the inside, we had lot of, uh, a lot of real-world uh, data and insight about our customers' revenue, what products uh, had, uh, were getting the most sales, and we were able to transition onto finding winning products for other customers as well. So we introduced a product research service and by using that insight that we had, using uh, data that our competitors didn't have, we were able to brand ourselves as not only an Amazon listing copywriting service, but also a, a consulting firm that also helps you discover new profitable products and therefore we also help you make more money by doing that as well so we now have another competitive advantage that our competitors didn't have that makes so much sense so you're basically you're basically taking the assets that you have and you're positioning them in a way to where it's the most attractive to your customers and then 
each time you take that next step up in your business and you upgrade and you upgrade and you upgrade, you're, you're using that and leveraging that to continue to upgrade and building momentum and really positioning yourself as the person or the brand or the company that your customers simply have to work with. Because if, if I'm an Amazon brand and I'm thinking, okay, this is the most res- reviewed consulting business in the whole Amazon space has the most reviews on the platform. Like that's a no brainer to me. And Oh, they've, they've worked with 10,000 other businesses. I know they're good. Hundred, 116 different countries. I know they're, they're rock solid. So that makes so much sense. Um, question for you before you really have a track record, how do you position yourself? Because it is a competitive world out there and we know we're trying to dominate here. How do we, how do we get that, that initial foothold, that, that initial, uh, uh, when, when we don't have any results to show yet, how do we position ourselves in that scenario? You promise the world and you deliver the universe. So basically you make, uh, as an outrageous promise about the delivery that you can make as it's humanly possible. And then you move the world, you move mountains in order to deliver on that promise. Because if you don't, um, your business is going to go south. So you don't have any other option. So if you tell the customer, my sales copy is going to make you, uh, is going to increase your revenue by 20% you better uh, increase their revenue by 30%. And the way you deliver on that promise is by honing your skill that's related to the service that you're offering. Uh, And that works perfectly in the service industry because when you're offering a service, you have a skill that you're monetizing. And therefore, if you keep personally working on that skill and you increase your competence in that area, it just easier, it becomes easier progressively to deliver bigger and bigger promises because you just personally get better. Now, when you have another kind of business where you, let's say you sell a physical product, you could, I don't know, you could promise that you could deliver your pro- the product to the customer faster than all your competitors can deliver it. And then you have to go back to the drawing board and think about how you can do that. Maybe you should negotiate with your supplier and or discover a supplier who just delivers faster than all of your competitors maybe you should pay your supplier a premium for exclusivity or for delivering your product faster to your competitors and then you have the advantage of being the the physical products business that just delivers it could be the same product but it just goes to your consumer to your the consumer faster so the consumer is going to prefer you or maybe you add uh, a bigger quantity. Maybe uh, when you're starting, you just have 10K more in deployable capital than your competitor. And then you can use that to buy more products in bulk. And then you afford, you can afford to sell at a slightly lower price and with faster shipping rates. So there are many ways you can find your competitive advantage. And it all depends on what's your starting point and what uh, kind of assets you have when you're beginning. When you're beginning. That makes so much sense. Um, so I want to move into our fourth fundamental here. Uh, we are running a little bit short on time. Um, so I want to, I want to talk about customer acquisition in, in, in different phases of the business. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the way I think about customer acquisition is like having an elementary school approach, a high school approach and a university approach. And each approach gets progressively harder, just like in those stages of your formal education, the subjects that you're studying get more and more complex. So let's say you are in elementary school, you wanna do the easiest thing possible to set up a foundation that's gonna propel you to, it's gonna take you to high school. So you find a way to generate free traffic in a way that uh, you don't spend much on advertising, if not at all, and you just uh, grab, you get customers 
from maybe from a platform that offers them to you on a silver platter, which is what I chose to do with Fiverr. I didn't have any money to pay for ads. So why not choose Fiverr to sell my service through the platform because they have already developed their traffic. And basically I ethically steal their clientele and I have Fiverr pay for the ads instead of paying it myself and I just rely on word of mouth marketing and referrals to grow in the beginning. So if you are an e-commerce, um, <clears throat> if you're an e-commerce seller, you do that by going on Amazon and selling your product on there because Amazon already has millions and millions of customers. So you take the, that already existing pool and you go and fish in there. And then as you, as you do that and you get some revenue in by that source of free traffic, you transition onto the next level where you maybe go outside of that source of free traffic and you try to cold approach customers, which in the case of e-commerce wouldn't really work that well to sell, send cold emails and do uh, cold calling or maybe you could use social media. You could go on Instagram and start posting relevant content that your customers want to find. And through that content, <clears throat> you get the traffic that you need in order to sell your product. And then when you go on to the next level where it's uh, <clears throat> the university level, you start working with advertisements and paid traffic and all the difference between those methods is just in the skill sets you have to possess in order to use them. In the beginning, when you're working with free traffic, all you need is basically your product or your course, uh, your core skill that your self, that your service is built around of and having a unique selling proposition and differentiating yourself from your competitors. You do not have to concern yourself with um, traffic generation, maybe with payment processing. If you're using Fiverr to sell a service or Amazon to sell a product, you don't have to set any kind of payment infrastructure or even do web design. It's all there ready for you. But if you then want to go and build on your own website, control your traffic, you have to either have financial resource to do that or you have to have additional skill sets on top of what you already have. And then when you go on to advertising and leveraging paid traffic in order to sell your products, that's another skill that you have to possess or you have to have built some uh, financial firepower in order to have the ability to hire somebody who has that skill set. Because as you scale uh, a business, you cannot have, you cannot possibly have the time to develop all the skill sets needed in order to fully leverage every single avenue of uh, client acquisition. But as you slowly build up some revenue, you can use that in order to move up higher up the ladder and then hire people with the skill sets that you're missing in order to draw more customers in. That is brilliant. So it seems like we're starting with free traffic and using other platforms that will send customers to us. Then we're moving to paid traffic. And then eventually we're moving into building a team of people who are way better at all of these different uh, channels and uh, skill sets than we are to really take ourselves to the, to the next level. That makes a ton of sense. Um, Damien, I want to thank you so, so much for coming on the show today and sharing your story, uh, speaking about these four fundamentals of business and for, you know, really just providing such tremendous value to everybody. Um, thank you very much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you too, Ben, for inviting me and having me on, man. Absolutely. Been, been uh, my pleasure. So for everybody who wants to learn a little bit more about you, get more involved, uh, where would they go to do so? Uh, they could follow me on social media at Damien Prosa on Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Awesome. Perfect. 
So Damien, I want to thank you again so, so much. Everybody's watching and listening. I want to thank you and I will see you on the next episode. Take care now.